Bauhaus, often incorrectly referred to as an architectural movement, was a distinguished German design school whose practices have profoundly influenced our approach to design, art and architecture today. Founded by prominent architect and visionary Walter Gropius in 1919, Bauhaus was established on unconventional, experimental, modernist and contradictory principles as Gropius sought to break down the barrier between artist and maker. Gropius rejected artistic traditions and approached architecture holistically, where he was committed to a social democratic future enabled by excellent and functional design. However, Gropius's vision of egalitarianism never saw fruition as the school notoriously suppressed female students during a time when women had newly established parity with their male counterparts. With numerous iconic designs, artists, architects and trailblazers emerging from Bauhaus, the women of Bauhaus have often been overlooked and overshadowed. Only in recent years have researchers highlighted the importance of women, played in the school and their contributions to design practices today. This begs the question, what role did the women of Bauhaus play? Through all the criticism and hardships Bauhaus bestowed upon its female students and faculty, several women made a significant impact on design. Four women, Gunther Stoltz, Marianne Brandt, Annie Albers and Friedel Dicker played phenomenal roles in Bauhaus's impact and have subtly influenced how we approach design today through their contributions to art, weaving and metalwork. These women creative, created innovative designs and techniques that helped shape not only the curriculum and pedagogy of the Bauhaus movement, but textile production and art therapy today. Bauhaus was founded in post-World War Germany during the Weimar Republic, Germany's first democracy. The Weimar Republic was formed on the, a new constitution that aimed to be acceptable to both the politically progressive and conservative without being too radical. It also, for the first time, gave a voice to the German people and more importantly, the women of Germany, allowing them the right to vote and new social freedoms such as career paths and access to educational institutions that were previously reserved for men. When Bauhaus first opened its doors in 1919, it encouraged women to enrol, with Gropius stating that there would be no distinction between the fair and the strong sex. This resulted in an influx of women enrolling into the institution, with the first year of classes seeing 52% of its students being female. The promise of equality was exceptionally attractive among women, as they had previously been denied access to serious art institutions making Bauhaus a beacon of hope for female artists across Germany. Amongst the backdrop of Germany's financial depression and cultural term turmoil, Gropius and Bauhaus's appointed masters grew increasingly worried about the school's reputation and survival. They worried that such high numbers of female students would appoint the school with an amateurish status, resulting in a vote amongst the school masters to make it harder for women to enrol. In an unlawful action at the time, as women held equal opportunity to men, Gropius announced during a meeting that they were to ensure female students take up no more than one third of the bodies. As a consequence of this vote and the implementation of higher admission standards for women, Bauhaus cultivated a community of remarkably creative woman, women. One such individual was Gunther Stoltz. Gunther came to Bauhaus upon the school's opening in 1919, where she first attended wall and glass painting workshops. However, Gunther, like many of her female peers, was quickly funneled into weaving programs. It's here, despite the school's limited resources, she excelled, often collaborating with fellow students, most notably woodworking student Marcel Brewer. The pair's most significant design was a one-of-a-kind five-legged chair known as the African chair. This chair, created during Bauhaus's early expressionist years, showcased Gunther's weaving skills and unique textiles designs. Unlike the ornamental style of textiles to come out of the predeceasing Art Nouveau, Gunther's work was colourful, expressionistic and abstract. Gunther's innovative and progressive approach to weaving quickly gained recognition by the masters, 
and she was appointed the first female master in 1926. This opened up opportunities for other female faculty members, female weavers and textile designers to achieve international success. With Gunther's direction, weaving turned from modern to industrial as she had her students experiment with synthetic materials, which they tested for flexibility, wear resistance, light refraction and acoustic absorption. The fabrics and prototypes produced in her workshops became one of the school's most significant sources of income. However, despite her success as a master, Gunther faced discrimination, such as lower pay than her male colleagues and no right to a pension. This, alongside the rising political tensions in Germany and tensions among the Bauhaus masters led to Gunther's ultimate resignation from Bauhaus. Marianne Brandt is another standout female figure who broke barriers in Bauhaus. Whilst most women were discouraged from taking male-dominated workshops such as metalworks, Marianne was the exception after catching the eye of Laszlo Moholo Nagy, who was the head of metalworks. Laszlo recognised her talent after seeing her work in the preliminary course and encouraged her to enrol. Despite being one of 14 women to enter the metal workshop, Marianne was the only female student to emerge with a degree in metalworks. However, her success wasn't without difficulties as she faced hazing from her male peers. She later recounted these struggles. At first I was not accepted with pleasure. There was no place for a woman in a metal workshop they felt. They admitted this to me later on and meanwhile expressed their displeasure by giving me all sorts of dull, dreary work. Despite these challenges, Marianne persevered and after the resignation of Laszlo, became acting director of the metal workshop. Marianne's position was short-lived as she became increasingly frustrated with challenges to her authority by her male colleagues and ultimately resigned in 1929. Marianne's work today has become prolific with multiple designs such as lamps, household objects and ashtrays still popular. Marianne's first design, a small metal tea infuser, selling at auction for 361,000, setting a record for the highest earning piece of work to come out of Bauhaus. The piece is said to be quintessentially Bauhaus as it encompasses its core principles of rationalism, function and form. Whilst other prolific designers of the time, such as George Christian Gebeline, designed overly decorative metalworks, Marianne took on the Bauhaus approach and developed a tea infuser with little to no decoration, purely focusing on its function. This design influence can be seen today with English designer Tom Dixon paying homage to Marianne with his own version, a form stainless steel tea set. Marianne can also be cre credited for creating one of the most commercially successful designs to come out of Bauhaus the Candom bedside table lamp. With its sleek modern design, the Candom is lamp is still relevant and widely replicated today. Another woman to find success out of Bauhaus was Annie Albers. Annie came to Bauhaus in 1922, hoping to pursue painting. However, due to gender restrictions enforced by Walter Gropius, Annie could only enroll in the women's workshops, namely textiles, bookbinding and ceramics. Although not impressed with the prospects of textiles as she aspired to do a real man's job, she never le nevertheless enrolled in the weaving workshop. With the workshop having no syllabus and little expectations of its students, Annie soon learnt to appreciate the flexibility and freedom she had to explore. With Annie's self-paced exploration of weaving, she experimented with a grid system, creating one-of-a-kind artistic pieces. In 1925, the weaving workshop moved to the modernist building in Dessau, providing the students access to higher tech equipment as the school focused its attention on mass production. At this time, Annie collaborated with fellow student Gunther Stoltz to create a syllabus that was considered innovative for my time, for its time, and still used today. 
Now students in the workshop were required to demonstrate a comprehensive understanding of weaving, fabric production, colour mixing, experimentation of different fibres and how to create prototypes for mass production using machinery. With Annie's freedom to experiment, she successfully made a pioneering architectural fabric with sound absorption properties, seeing velvet fabric applied to the back of light reflecting woven fabric. Annie's focus embodied Bauhaus's core principles to make functional design appropriate for mass production, a cost-cutting technique that was much needed in Germany's economic state. Another Bauhaus graduate who significantly impacted the world of art and design was Jewish-born Friedrika Dicker. She first enrolled at Bauhaus with her friend Franz Singer in 1919, already having received an extensive education in art. While attending the school, she studied painting, textiles and metalwork, and with Singer she opened the first Montessori kindergarten in Germany, now a highly respected worldwide educational institution that nurtures creative thinking. Friedel's efforts and gifts for teaching were recognised by Gropius, who praised her work at Bauhaus. Friedel maintained her individuality and authenticity as both a student and an artist while attending the school making a lasting impression on the school's directors. Having grown up poor, she deeply sympathised with the lower classes, motivating her to join the Communist Party. This inspiration was at the forefront of her designs as she became known for her multifunctional designs, such as multi-use furniture and spaces, allowing the user to do more with less. As housing sizes reduce and the cost of living expenses increase, the demand for multi-purpose furniture has become more evident, from sofas that transform into beds to the versatile spaces found in tiny homes, Friedel's impact can be widely observed in modern furniture design. With the rise of the Nazi party, Friedel relocated to Vienna and then Prague, where she became a mentor to Edith Kramer, a pioneer in art therapy. Unfortunately, Friedel was eventually captured and imprisoned by the Nazis and sent to the Three Friedenstadt ghetto. Whilst in prison, she gave drawing and painting lessons to many of the camp's children, bringing much needed humanity to an intolerable situation and carrying on the Bauhaus ideas. Tragically, Friedel was deported to Auschwitz in October 1944 and died in a gas chamber. Despite her death, her legacy continues through her contributions to the Bauhaus, her work in multifunctional designs and her impact on art therapy. Like many of her female peers, Friedel's story is a poignant reminder of the importance of preserving artistic and intellectual freedom and the devastating impact of oppressive regimes on art. Despite the challenges they faced, women like Gunther Stoltz, Friedel Dicker and Marianne Brandt broke barriers and made significant impacts in their field. Whether it be through their contributions to creative pedagogy, their experimentation with modern textiles or their approach to functional design, these women have paved the way for future generations of female artists and designers and helped create the legacy of Bauhaus as an influential modern design movement.